Hey, indie filmmakers, I'm Griffin Hammond. I'm Nick Bodmer, and on this week's episode, we're talking about frames per second and a new open source way to measure them. Plus, your questions about foggy lenses, appropriate audio levels, and if you can use garage band music in your commercial video projects. Griffin, I'd like to talk about fundamental measurements of time. <laughs> Actually, that sounds way more uh, <laughs> like philosophical than I think what we're actually talking about. Yeah, yeah. What are we talking about, Griffin? Talk, we're going to talk about frame rates today. Woohoo! We are using frames to capture this video right now. How many frames, Griffin? 30 every second in this video. And what is this new open source measure we're talking about? I actually don't know a whole lot about this. You told me about this, that Oculus, Oculus is the... The, the virtual reality. Ugh. Yes. Well, I'm going to break some stuff. but For some reason, guys. for a second, I was, I was forgetting which is the preferred term. Spherical video, VR, but I guess it's kind of all of those things. Spherical video is only a small part of what I could do VR thing can be, VR. I guess. Yeah, I mean, I've used most of most of what I do in VR is, you know, computer generated games and things like that. And don't you have an Oculus headset? Yes, I was I was just showing it off on camera oh. <laughs> while you were blathering about whatever you were blathering about. So the but headline yeah. here is Oculus creates a new open source unit of time to measure frame rates. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So so frame, frame rates, rates are, are not tricky, good enough? right? Right, because it's uh, often with the the common units of measure, and I'm reading from an Ars Technica article here that we'll put in the show notes, like uh, millisecond or nanosecond. When you start talking about frame rates, you start to get like leftovers. You get decimal points, which yeah. don't make sense, right? So they've come out with a new definition called a flick, uh, and it divides a single second into precisely 705,600,000 parts. Yeah. So it's very small. And this allows what? It allows, uh, it was constructed in such a way so that 24 frames per second film, 90 frames per second VR games, all the way up to 16,000 frame per section, frames per second ultra slow motion could be measured with whole numbers. So that's yeah. what they did. They came up with a way to do that. And uh, then they created a bunch of code for people who are writing video editing applications or video games or whatever they want to be able to integrate with those uh with that unit of time easily um, so even it like so it's funny we, we mentioned that we're shooting in 30 frames per second but we're actually not we're shooting in 29.97 which is the ntsc standard so even for regular everyday television sort of video that we're shooting right now we're shooting in a fraction in a number that it's not it's a messy number but I imagine there is a integer number of flicks that could represent twenty nine nine seven. I would imagine that is absolutely correct. Yeah, and they also it also lines up with a common audio sampling rates like forty four point one kilohertz mm. and forty eight k forty eight thousand kilohertz. Is that right? Um, so that you know that's a problem we have with drift. Is right? Is those those measurements of time don't always sync up, and so this would uh, this would help with that. I thought it was kind of neat. And I think, uh, so to reiterate, you said a flick is one seven hundred and five millionth, approximately. There's seven hundred and five million six hundred thousand flicks in a second. In a second. That's right. And I think someone commented, like, why that number? It's giant. Um, yeah, I mean, because of so many, I mean, when you start talking about 96,000 kilohertz, that's a lot of uh, numbers in a second. And if you want to be able right. to get even integers of all this stuff, you got to get down pretty small. So essentially, they, they've like multiplied a bunch of these, maybe not all of them, because many of them fit inside each other already. But I guess if you take all the outliers and multiply them, then you'll have this number that can capture everything. Yeah, and it's an energy quantity that can exactly represent a single frame duration for bo for all of 24, 25, 30, 48, 50, 60, 90, 100, 120, and uh, one one thousandth of each. So it's just, you know, an integer number that would, you know, it makes all those numbers divisible properly. Yeah. And so you had to go pretty high to get one. 
so here we could we could give this thing a real world test because I shot a variety of frame rates over the weekend. Okay. I went up to my friend, my friend Stephen Caitlin. They have a they have a house that they are renovating, and so we we went to visit, and I actually we were helping them de- demolish a bathroom. I'm sure you were a big help. You didn't just stand around and shoot video the whole time, right? No, actually, I think I was a pretty, I think I was a pretty good help, but I was okay. also sometimes standing around <laughs> shooting video, but I was just capturing the moments. Uh, and so let's see, I was shooting 4K60 sometimes uh, to to just have, you know, some kind of slow motion. So let's see, if I do 60, if it's 60... 60 frames a second, then I guess I could just take 705 million, 600,000 divide and by divide 60. that by 60, right? And that's how many and flicks you were shooting at. So each frame was 11,760,000 flicks. Boom. But then I also was shooting in the GH5's 180 frames per second. Ooh. So let's divide 705 million, 600,000 by 180 and yes that is also divisible by 180 so uh, those frames were each only 3,920,000 flicks it's a lot of flicks you shot yeah and then my audio sample rate was probably 48,000 I don't know anyway that's also so divisible let's let's just check it let's check it 705 hmm. 600 zero, 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 divided by 48 one two three 14,700 flicks. Yeah. So is this something filmmakers need to be worried about this unit of time? No. But I just thought it was interesting seeing people kind of take a new and novel approach to how we talk about uh, time when it comes down to media. Well, and it sounds like it makes more sense from like a coding gaming sort of standpoint. Like if you want something to happen. I mean, this was actually, this was always kind of the weird part of editing. Some editing software would only let you place keyframes right on a frame or something. You know, maybe even, even if you're editing audio, audio. You have a lot more editing points than that, yeah. Right. So, yeah, for audio, are we supposed to have, like, 48,000 potential points? Good, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the data's there. So I do like that Final Cut, and I imagine Premiere does this too, will let you edit audio independent of where those frames land. But you can imagine if you're the people writing the code for Final Cut, something like this could be very handy as a way to right. integrate all these different um, frame rates and uh, and uh, refresh rates that you have to deal with. So anyway, and I like neat. this idea that you could you could kind of future proof your your coding that you're doing. Like you've designed this for a game that's going to be displayed in someone's eyes in a VR headset at 180 frames per second, but then later down the road. We all decide, no, actually 200 frames per second is what really makes VR feel immersive. Then it doesn't really change anything. You, From the beginning, you designed this movement to last X number of flicks, and it, right. it should be translatable without creating problems. I think that's right. So cool. what, did, what did you find uh, shooting these various frame rates? Did you have any trouble combining those in the end? No, I'm still I'm still putting together the edit. We we did I think probably the coolest thing I shot uh, besides me. Did you see me throw in the toilet in I the did. dumpster? I did. <laughs> so that was shot in 180. And then the other cool thing was we were hammering tiles on the bathroom floor, and they were Smashing shattering them up good. And that just looked really cool. There's lots of dust, and uh, I I also found that just putting one work light. I definitely needed light, a lot of light when I was shooting. 180 because it's yeah. dropping my shutter down uh, so much but just having one work light near the camera kind of off to the side not only did it give me enough light for exposure but it just it made all the dust and it was almost <laughs> like kind of there was so much dust it almost looked like smoke at one point uh, but it just worked really well that's awesome but and did you was, finish the construction project their house is completely renovated now thanks to your help no, we uh, we finished tearing out everything. <laughs> There's still a lot of work to be done. But it was interesting being around my friends there because a lot of them, uh, we started having conversations about frame rates. And 
my friend Alex. As, as you do in a social yeah. gathering. Well, Alex was wondering kind of why we use all these different frame rates and why some things... It started with, like, why do things look different on TV? Uh, you know, why does, like, 60 FPS look so different from 24? And so we started having a conversation about why people hate 60. Mm-hmm. And, if, and have you heard my theory for why I think people think 24 looks better than 60? I think I have, but I can't remember. I always go back to it's what they're used to, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I mean, that that's my whole thing. It's just, it's it's people are, people have been conditioned by film over the years and also conditioned by TV that film is 24 and it's the more artistic, more cinematic medium where the where more money is really being spent uh, and more production value. And then you have TV that's a little bit more low budget and it's 30 frames per second. And over the years, our brains have learned that less frames correlates to higher production value. And so Mm -hmm. we respect it more when we see it. And I think that's all it is. I think it's just a trigger in our brain that we're, we're, we've equated more frames with less quality. So then when you show someone 60 frames per second, there's just something about it. They're like, oh, you know, it's the soap opera effect. That's what they call it. But uh, I think it's just triggering that same idea in your head that it must be worse. So do you think over time we're going to move to higher and higher frame rates? I mean, I think it's inevitable. And I think I understand why why some filmmakers are trying to push push the envelope a little bit and do more frames because you are getting more clarity. You're giving the audience more more data to look at and sports is going that way because sports are clearer to watch in 60 than they are in 30 Mm -hmm. and of course in vr you have to be what what's an appropriate frame rate for for the oculus you you really got to hit 60 yeah at least 60 and and higher is better (laughs) yeah because it won't feel immersive uh otherwise and i mean you can make the argument that film is not supposed to be immersive it's supposed to like I don't know, signal the art and and you f- you're not completely suspending disbelief. You're supposed to feel that it's cinema. But uh, Alex Speaking had, of sports, did you watch the Super Bowl? I actually didn't. <laughs> did you know the Super Bowl was on? <laughs> I did. I was driving home when it was happening, so I oh, listened to some good. of it on the radio. I know that... Uh, actually, I didn't hear firsthand that the Eagles won, but I know that now. It was very exciting. Oh, yeah. I heard anyway, it continue. Game. You were saying about Alex. You were saying about Alex. I don't know so, why I got us on football. So after I was, ex- we we talked about why uh, why these frame rates are used, and she had questions about like why you know why do we use twenty four and twenty five and thirty and sixty, and, um, and so I was explaining how they use twenty five in the UK and thirty here because of the the power, power. cycles, right? That's why yeah. why we do it, right? I think so. Yeah, because they're fifty hertz and we're sixty. Yeah. And so I, I was showing her light flicker. In fact, you know, in one of the slow motion shots I, that I got, I was pointing out how it, at 180 frames per second, you can see the uh, 60 hertz lighting flicker because it's flickering 60 times a second and the light, the camera's picking up three frames for every flicker. Mm-hmm. But her question to me was if I believe that more frames are better and we think that audiences are just kind of stuck in 24 because that's what they're used to her suggestion was why don't you just make movies like one extra frame every year (laughs) well that's (laughs) not the worst idea i've ever heard i mean it would introduce some uh some difficulties along the way i think as you're at some odd frame rates but uh, but yeah, if we if we did a whole year of like if next year all the movies in theaters were twenty five frames per second, and then the year after twenty six, could we push it all the way up to sixty without people freaking out? Uh, I think you'd still get some freak out. I think yeah. uh, the problem is people don't watch just new movies. Yeah, I thought it was a a, a great idea. It's a great never, no, it is a great idea. I never thought of that before, but the. The immediate problem that jumps in my head is lighting. That yeah, when you get into those odd frame rates, then you get into the odd flickers. So right. So, I, I was kind of saying like you'd have to jump like Dang. you know you'd almost have to jump straight from like thirty to sixty. Like there's 
Or you, or you have to change the lighting like, the whole like way. Like The Hobbit. Right. But then or was The Hobbit she, like 45? The Hobbit was 48. 48. Oh, right. Yeah. 24 to 48. Yeah. <laughs> but I assume, you know, as she pointed out, she was like, well, don't they have to use special lighting for films anyway? Because they're 24? And I never really thought about it, but it's like, I guess, yeah. Um, you know, they're not using the same lighting. Uh, right. They're, they're using... Actually, I mean, I imagine those lights are almost perfectly continuous so you probably could get away with a lot of different frame rates so maybe that solves the problem well i expect you to start doing that then yeah it did make me think of an idea that i would like to try out i suppose someone else can steal this idea if they want i at least like the idea of in one piece mixing mixing frame rates like even in the same frame like imagine if wait oh like a split screen or something well, like, imagine if a character was moving through a frame and you almost rotoscoped it or did it with a green screen or something where the background was moving at 24, let's say, and the person in the foreground was moving at 60. Hmm. Although... What, what would the <laughs> effect of that be? I don't know. Besides Although making I'm, someone's head explode. I'm immediately realizing, though, that you'd have something moving... One, one thing would be moving while the background wasn't moving, you know, for... For that gap right. in between that might just look really really jarring really fake probably yeah probably get that ma- massive green screen effect you see sometimes but i'm interested to try it i'd like to yeah i like the idea Do it. yeah well i think that's that's all we have to talk about for frames you mean flicks have we captured enough flicks and frames of that conversation <laughs> How, so we're 17 i'm 17 minutes into my recording how many flicks is that oh this is gonna be a lot let's do it Wait. let's find out okay so 17 minutes times 60 <coughs> seconds times 60 seconds we're up to 1020 1, second. seconds times 705 600 zero, zero, zero. just for reference let's start with frames <coughs> we've recorded around 30,000 frames so far this podcast i guess we can double that if we're counting that we shoot two different cameras and we're and closing many... in on 720 billion flicks. <laughs> Just fun. Yeah. Do we have any questions, Griffin, that we're going to answer? Yes. In just a moment, we'll answer your questions about foggy lenses, appropriate audio levels, and if you can use GarageBand, the free GarageBand loops, in your commercial video projects. Handy Filmmakers is brought to you by Squarespace. Whether you need a domain, website, or online store, make it with Squarespace. Nick, do you remember how we used to be really smart in high school and we could make our own websites? Yes. Are you still that smart? Like, I still know HTML and a little bit of CSS. I mean, actually, I was just thinking about this. I want to redo my website because I don't really do wedding videos anymore. And I was thinking, like, why would I do that when I can just (laughs) make it on Squarespace and be done? But I still, I want ed- some advanced features that I'm used to from before. So, like, it's funny that one of the things I like most on my site is that I can get to all the URL mappings easily. What does that mean? Like, I all the redirects. Oh, yeah. I, I realize I do a lot of redirects on the website. If I just pull this up, in uh, if I go to advanced on my Squarespace site to URL, ma- URL mappings, for instance, I have griffinhammond.com slash gear points to kit.com slash griffin hammond slash blah 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 like goes to oh yeah 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 yep yeah but i let's see i have 38 redirects set up right now Jeez. a lot of them a lot of them are actually the the podcast because actually technically hey.film points to griffin hammond.com slash podcast right yeah but uh <laughs> i don't know why i thought that would be a cool like Squarespace website thing to share with you today but <laughs> <laughs> well I mean that's the kind of n- nerdy features we like and you wouldn't think necessarily you could do that kind of a thing when you kind of go with a hosted platform like this but they do really give you kind of all the features you need right and you yes. can go in and edit even edit the code of any page right yeah actually I did that the other day because I realized somehow I had neglected to put my Google Analytics header code in you know you need Oops. the yeah uh, but there's a place in the advanced settings for just like insert code into the header of every page um which you know i 
I used to do that when I built did my own HTML, but I'd have to go and like plug it in on multiple pages and unless I was using a template, now it's just easy. Well, you can head to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Griffin, which is probably a redirect, to save ten percent off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thanks, Squarespace. That's their redirect. I should make a griffinhammond.com slash squarespace redirect. <laughs> We can get into some sort of cyclical loop. <laughs> right. <laughs> Sounds dangerous. So we're going to start today with an email we got from Mike, who is a teacher in Maryland. I like this question because it's it's like solving his entire uh, checklist of, of issues. Uh, he wants to shoot videos interviewing teachers, and he wants them to look professional and sound good on a limited budget, and he's thinking he's going to get the GH4, Okay. which... I imagine it is a pretty good price right now. Um, yeah, absolutely. So he stumbled across my setup video, and he has a mm-hmm. few questions. The first is, what lens should he buy to get the best picture, or just use the okay. one that comes with it? Are we going to answer each one as we go? Yeah. <clears throat> well, I think for the best, if, if you're doing interview shots, right, you probably want something a little tighter than just a wide-angle lens. Um and uh, something with a with a nice wide aperture for that nice blurry black background. So, I don't know. I think something like a thirty to forty millimeter prime. What do you think? Yeah, I was just thinking like if he doesn't want to spend very much, I'm not going to recommend the twelve to thirty five, which is a great Pricey. documentary and interview lens, but it's a thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, thinking along the lines of relatively low price and big aperture. I was thinking like the 20 millimeter might actually be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So my my feeling, and I like to shoot, I think, think tighter than you do, is that that's a little yeah. wide for yeah. everything. Um, but I almost said the 45, which is probably too tight. So there's probably a happy medium in there somewhere. Right. I, wonder, I don't even know which one would come with it. It depends on the kit he gets. It depends on the kit you get. But you'll probably get a kit lens with like a 12 to 60. And to be honest, you could do a lot of damage with that with just the right lighting. Yeah. So. Well, yeah. If you have a zoom lens, make sure you're lighting. You might be able to get away with natural light if you just get a prime lens. Yep. Uh, his second question is, what microphone should he use? And does it plug right into the camera? On a budget, I would say you probably do not want to plug right into the camera. Wouldn't you agree? Well, I mean, like some of these, some of these mics, like the the Rode Video Mic Go, I mm-hmm. think it's eighty dollars, and it is intended to plug right into the camera. But I imagine if you just, I, I don't think you want to put mics on top of cameras if they are right. a few feet away from your subject. But that's a mic that you could get, you know, just a headphone extender cable, and probably figure out a way to get it closer to your subject. And as long as you're not running it over a power cable to introduce. Uh, noise, you know, interference, I, I would imagine it'll sound okay. I would just monitor it to make sure you're getting good audio. Sure. Uh, always better to get the microphone closer. That's that's the key. Even like a lower quality mic that is right next to your subject is going to sound a lot better than uh, an yeah. expensive mic far away. So just get it as but close also, as you can. I mean, use an iPhone, right, with voice recorder yeah. and get it get it up right by the by the subject and it'll sound well, really well, good. Well, yeah, these days, even, even if you're not using the built-in mic on your iphone you people are buying these like lav mics that plug right into the iphone and that would be one good way to do it yep and then his last question is do i have to use final cut pro or can i use something simpler like imovie i think um for for what uh mike is describing already i have a feeling he's gonna grow out of imovie pretty fast what do you think well, yeah, I wish I was more up on exactly what iMovie's capabilities are these days. My my instinct is that it would do everything he needs to do. Surely it can do the kind of basic editing he needs for these interviews. But if he is doing something like synchronizing audio between an iPhone and the video on the, the camera, I'm, I actually don't even know if iMovie does that. Yeah, I don't know. I have not yeah. really used it. But I do know that Apple now offers a uh, a bundle of their pro apps for education. Have you heard of this? Well, yeah, it seems like they've done this over the years. I don't know what the pricing is. It's now I think it's new or newish. It's one ninety nine, and you get 
I was like, don't you get like Final Cut Pro you, and compressor? You get and Final motion? Cut Pro, you get Logic, you get Motion, Compressor, and what's Main Stage Three? But whatever that is. But you get, I, I mean, Final Cut Pro is three hundred on its own. Logic Pro is two hundred on its own. Motion and Compressor each fifty bucks, but you get the whole thing for one ninety nine. So, I think that's a steal. Yeah. And then you know, you're set. Well, and if if you, Mike, if you learn iMovie, all these editing softwares are kind of laid out the same way. So you'll learn the skills that would also transfer to Final Cut Pro. I would recommend trying as much as you can in iMovie, and when you run into a problem, Google it. That's how you learn to edit, and chances are someone has a solution for it. And eventually there'll be a problem that you run into that someone says, oh, you just can't do that in iMovie. You need Final Cut. But until you get to that point, I would get away with iMovie as long as you can. And the only disagreement I'll make with you there, Griffin, is I think if you're going as far as to buy a GH4, you're probably ready to step up past iMovie already. But I could be wrong. Yeah. I could be. Yeah. I could see your disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, yeah, I say that as a super happy Final Cut Pro editor, so <laughs> <laughs> maybe you should just get this thing I like using. The little bit I've used iMovie for, it, it gets just frustrating when you because if you're trying to do like really. Uh, detailed edits it just it's not designed to cut quickly and easily right yeah which is what drives me nuts but it's great if like like it's like movie trailer mode and you pick like five clips and it puts them all together for you and makes something that looks good but if you want to you know have a little more control it's tougher yeah all right griffin we got an email from john he says since you've been to dubai recently i'm hoping you can help me with an issue i've had there with my lenses fogging up i'll be going back again later this year last time i was there i had trouble with my lens fogging up when going from indoors to outdoors uh what do you think he's had trouble last time he couldn't keep his lens clear so it sounds like he's going into a super cool mall it can get really hot in the summer in dubai uh, i was actually there at a pretty nice time in the winter uh, but still really warm so if, if he's inside where it's super cold his camera's getting cold and then he goes outside mm -hmm. and there's enough humidity in the air that that is condensating on the camera or even inside the lens i guess mm -hmm. we've talked about this before i think is condensating a word i think so i don't know it's not Isn't... condensing oh yeah maybe you're right <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> it's condensation. So I'm going to use the verb condensating. <laughs> but, what are your uh, tra I mean, did you run into this at all while you were there? I didn't, but it may be because I wasn't there in these in the super hot, hot. Because I imagine the bigger the difference in temperature, the easier this, this is likely to happen. Um, yep. So one thing that he points out is that he will have two cameras, a GH5 and a G85. And I've found that, you know, even if I'm like, in, if I'm in a cold environment and I, I put my cold camera in my, in my camera bag and I go into a warm environment and I'm in there for hours, I can pull my camera out of my bag and it's still really cold. Like the bag mm -hmm. seems to insulate it. So I would think... If you have two cameras, I would use one of them inside and one of them outside. Just If you're inside, just leave one of them in the bag from when you were outside, and hopefully it'll stay warm enough that when you go back out there, you won't have that problem. Yep, yeah, and the other thing, I mean, he does say this, what do you do when, if you don't have time to let the camera warm up? But that is that is probably the best thing you can do is just know when you first step out, you're going to have to wait 10 or 20 minutes for it to warm up again in your bag slowly so it doesn't uh, condense so quickly. Yeah. This sounds like you just need to, like, leave a PA outside. <laughs> <laughs> That's in the, right. In the heat and guard Some a unpaid camera. intern. <laughs> And so that'd be a terrible job. <laughs> Here's a YouTube comment we got from Terme Bergamo. Uh, wondering if I change my f-stop during time lapses as the sun goes down. I guess it'd be opening the f-stop to compensate. And the answer is no. Yeah, you've seen me shoot time lapses. I don't generally do that, although... Yeah, let's see... Occasionally, I've experimented with it. I prefer time lapses where I don't have to change anything because I know it's going to look nice and smooth. Uh, in Dubai recently, just because I was shooting sunrise and I knew it was going to get so much brighter 
and I still wanted to potentially have some usable time lapse. I did put it into aperture priority. My thinking was I didn't want the f-stop to change because if the f-stop changes, then you know things that were in focus could go out of focus. I guess I just didn't want that to happen. Uh, yeah. So I played around with aperture priority, letting the shutter actually get quicker and quicker which is kind of weird because now I'm messing with motion blur and the motion blur will kind of diminish over time but it actually seemed to work pretty well interesting that's cool yeah I mean you could you could do either thing just know that anytime you're messing with f-stop or with shutter speed you're affecting not just exposure but another creative aspect of the image gets tricky quick (laughs) here's an email we got from Yannick wondering this was actually uh sent to you nick or Mm -hmm. about you he was wondering if we know people that are in it and also do filmmaking because he sees a lot of similarities in the skills needed for both especially in editing and a lot of it knowledge is quite important when doing filmmaking Uh, he also says that he enjoys filming more than editing as it keeps me away from my desk what are your thoughts on these ideas Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, especially in my part of the IT field, you know, a lot of what I'm doing is trying to, you know, take complex ideas and break them down into, you know, a more digestible format for an audience to to understand it. So uh, I see a lot of crossover between IT and filmmaking in that way. Um, Well, and especially in like tutorial videos, like you did that hard drive shucking tutorial video. Yeah. And... I imagine in a lot of ways that's similar to your job in that you have to explain these principles to people. Exactly, exactly. Uh, I, too, enjoy filming more than editing, so uh, he's not alone there. Although, let me ask you, which do you enjoy more, filming or editing? I started my career loving editing more, I think because my filming wasn't very good and my camera wasn't very good when I was 16 years old and editing was kind of the way you could make everything better and more professional. And now I'm getting to the point where I, I'm more confident in my shooting and I'm enjoying the shooting. I like being out and I'm inspired by the shooting. And then when I have to edit, it's like, oh, really? I kind of just... And sometimes I find myself shooting things that will never be edited just because I like the act of holding a camera and clicking record. Interesting. <laughs> I often say cool. that, to to go back to his, his original question, I, I often tell audiences that I like filmmaking because it's a way for me to be artistic when I don't feel like an artistic person. I, I can't really draw, uh, but I like technical stuff. I like IT stuff. And filmmaking is a way to tap into those skills and make something creative and artistic. So we got a YouTube comment from Raz Tech Studios. Hey guys, with the new sensor in the GH5S, would the Metabone Speed Booster work the same as with the GH5 or would there be some differences? Just wondering if you had any info or experience with that. You would definitely think it could work differently because the sensors are different sizes. The GH5S has Mm -hmm. a slightly larger sensor. But as we've talked about it it's it's larger and therefore it it uh it can't use the stabilization uh but it's taking up the same amount of space isn't it in relation to the lens yeah exactly so i think it should work just fine would be my thought because it's not moving yeah right yeah i think so (laughs) yeah i think so (laughs) I'm, I'm unsure about that. We think so. <laughs> so go ahead and make some purchasing decisions based on that. Right. <laughs> well, maybe we can find out, Griffin. Yeah. Yeah, who would I ask about that? <laughs> I don't know. I bet your buddies at Panasonic would know. Here's a Twitter question from Nick Farrell, or Farrell, I don't know. Uh, are there editing guidelines for audio levels in music or B-roll audio during an interview? Do you keep certain levels for interview versus background audio? When I edit with headphones, my background audio seems just right, but then I listen to my MacBook Pro speakers and the background audio seems low. Which should I rely on, editing with headphones or laptop speakers? Well, I think headphones is the short answer (laughs) because that's a more accurate representation. But you do 
and I find myself asking this, how is my audience going to watch this? Is it going to be on a home right. theater system? Is it going to be in a movie theater? Or is it a YouTube video where they're probably watching it with laptop speakers? So um, it depends on, on what you're producing, I think. Though, if you have to pick uh, you know, a source of truth, I think the higher quality audio uh, should win. Your thoughts, Griffin? Well, yeah, I usually start with headphones because you'll catch problems with headphones. But then I often finish an edit with the laptop speakers because I do find the same thing that uh, sometimes with headphones, it's hard to gauge that that gap between uh, your background audio and your your main audio. And maybe you have to mess with that a little bit uh, when you hear it on some uh, more limited speakers. But as for levels to land on i i guess i find that i'm usually putting my music somewhere around like negative 15 to negative 20 decibels Mm -hmm. and oftentimes my b-roll like my nat sound audio can sometimes be really low depending on what i'm going for sometimes it's like negative 30 or negative 25 if i really want to hear it it's probably around like negative 12 but it's generally not much higher than that and then audio for people talking i've heard some sound people say that it should be around negative 12 and i do that for some projects but then some things like the podcast because it's pretty much one volume the whole time i mean it doesn't vary too much we kind of push that up a little bit higher we're doing that around sometimes even over negative six maybe i'm aiming for like negative five uh, just because i know many people are going to be turning it up anyway or need the ability to turn it up in a loud environment uh, when they're listening with headphones or something. So in general, when a project is going on, you want to see the overall uh, volume bar where? For something like a YouTube tutorial, I'm often around negative six. But I think if you're making a movie or something, you save that louder stuff for explosions and things. And really you're putting voice around like negative 12. Interesting. Yeah. But if you've got voice at negative 12 and you've got background music and some nat sound, then you're probably pushing up into the negative 10, negative eight area, right? Yeah, I would think so. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. I think I master hotter than that, but I'm, I'm not saying I'm doing it right. Well, yeah, I used to throw everything like as high as I could go without peaking, which meant that I was kind of always aiming for like negative four or something, or, you know, at least that's where I was trying to get the peaks of people talking was like just over negative six. And it was only more recently when I I heard some sound people talking about like, no, that stuff should be down at negative 12, negative 15. I was like, oh, wow, maybe I've been being too loud. But you are loud the way the way people are consuming stuff now almost everyone has control of their audio I mean, it's one thing to make it for a theater where they the audience has no control but on youtube people can turn it up or down yep that's a good question an email from george what sort of clothes are you supposed to wear when you're working for a corporate client i want to look professional but not too laid back but also not pretentious it is funny that a lot of those considerations go into my head when I'm I'm picking out clothes. Sometimes it's <laughs> as simple as like I pick dark colors just because in the back of my mind I think like yeah I'm, I'm probably not gonna be on camera. But if let's say my I accidentally moved my arm or something in front, I don't know. Or you know if I when I did weddings I would usually wear dark colors just so that like I wouldn't show up too much in the yep. the background of the of the photos. But. Uh, I do want to look professional, but also creative. <laughs> and in New York, that usually means wearing jeans. Like, even if I'm going into a pretty nice corporate environment, jeans in New York are oftentimes considered professional enough. I'm and guessing at least nice jeans, though, right? You're not wearing ripped up jeans with holes in right. these. Right. Yeah. So usually I'm wearing, like, jeans and nice shoes and a, and a nice shirt. And like a button-up shirt? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but even in Sounds New York, right. I can get away with like an untucked dress shirt, and that can be viewed as plenty classy. You're a classy guy. <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've ever worn like really grungy clothes to like, <laughs> I don't know, like that was the tone of the to client fit or in. something. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I mean, I can't imagine you looking like pretentious unless you show up in a tux or something. 
or I don't I mean I, I can, I'm coming up with ideas that I think are pretentious but then I realize I'm just making judgments on what other people's fashion is so I'm not gonna do it right <laughs> our final question today is a Twitter question from Fred Yonke wondering if it's legal to use music you created in GarageBand on YouTube you're talking well, about how in GarageBand you're using their instruments and their loops and kind of their auto playing and things like that yeah I guess I've never actually used GarageBand, but it's it's often free software on Apple, right? Um, or at least years ago, it was free. Yeah, I think it is free. I you know it gets used a lot in my house on the iPad. Um, ah. The kids really like to make their own music with it. It's pretty cool, actually. You could, I mean, someone who's you know more talented than me could make some really cool stuff with it. I think uh, it's pretty powerful. So this cool is like there. you you set up like drum loops and bass loops and and cymbals and, and piano you and you can song. play or you can even do it like it kind of like it plays for you but you can hit like what key you want it so you can basically make melodies that sound good without knowing how to do it it's pretty cool yeah so without looking I, i've looked at the software license for GarageBand to answer this question but i'm curious oh, what okay. does your instinct tell you my instinct says yes. I would think you own the copyright to whatever you come up with in that. So yeah, I think I think you're right. It uh, the way that the 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 software license says it is that you may broadcast and or distribute your own music compositions or audio projects that were created using this content. However, individual audio loops may not be commercially or otherwise distributed on a standalone basis. So I'm guessing. If you just made oh, a video that was like... you can't rip off our product, but if you make your own stuff with it, you're good to go. Yeah. And so I imagine if you made like a YouTube video that was just like, hey, this is a audio loop from GarageBand, <laughs> and you just played it by itself. I mean, even that they may, may be okay with, because you've already now, you've, you've edited it into a video, and maybe it's harder for someone to like take it, but... Uh, but I think it, just to be safe, you should probably at least be stacking a couple things on top of each other, or at least changing it up a little bit. But knowing this, like, this is why GarageBand was created for you to make your compositions. I think they'd be pr pretty uh, unlikely to come after you. I think you're probably right. I think you are right. Let's make some music. You should check out GarageBand on your iPad. It's pretty cool. It's free now, so. I don't even think I have it on my... Oh, wait, I do have GarageBand on my computer right now. So maybe I should throw in some loops. <laughs> some sweet, some kick-ass loops. <laughs> uh, oh, it's downloading loops now. I don't want to download loops. I don't have enough yeah. hard drive space already. <laughs> Stop. Oh, it wants to fill up my hard drive with 12 gigs of loops. <laughs> Cancel. Sorry, Cancel folks. You're not getting any loops. <laughs> oh god, that really caused a problem here. <laughs> quit, quit. All right, I think Nick and I both need to get out of here because we both have GarageBand trying to take over our computer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Hammond, a pleasure. Yep. And uh, remember, you can always find show notes at hey.film. I think this week all we have is that one article we talked about at the beginning. Flicks. Yeah. And we'll talk to you in how many flicks? When will all the next episode be? A week from now? That's, that's a lot of flicks. Seven <laughs> times 24 <laughs> times 60. Am I doing that right? Times 60 again? Wait, no. Wait. Times. <laughs> Our flicks per se 600. Oh, yeah, no, that's right, yeah. Uh, 426 trillion flicks. We'll see you then. Okay. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, everyone. <laughs> so I was just like, oh, I'm a l I feel a little bit weird in a suit. Um, uh, my camera just died. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> We're rolling again, my friend. Okay. Sorry, folks, had a little battery problem.